An Ideal Family by Catherine Mansfield. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An Ideal Family by Catherine Mansfield. That evening, for the first time in his life, as he pressed through the swing door and ascended the three broad steps to the pavement, old Mr. Neve felt he was too old for the spring. Spring, warm, eager, restless, was there, waiting for him in the golden light, ready in front of everybody to run up, to blow in his white beard, to drag sweetly on his arm. And he couldn't meet her. No, he couldn't square up once more and stride off, jaunty as a young man. He was tired, and, although the late sun was still shining, curiously cold, with a numbed feeling all over. Quite suddenly he hadn't the energy, he hadn't the heart to stand this gaiety and bright movement any longer. It confused him. He wanted to stand still, to wave it away with his stick, to say, Be off with you. Suddenly it was a terrible effort to greet as usual, tipping his wide awake with his stick, all the people whom he knew, the friends, acquaintances, shopkeepers, postmen, drivers. But the gay glance that went with the gesture, the kindly twinkle that seemed to say, I'm a match and more for any of you, that old Mr. Neve could not manage at all. He stumped along, lifting his knees high as if he were walking through air that had somehow grown heavy and solid like water. And the homeward-looking crowd hurried by, the trams clanked, the light carts clattered, the big swinging cabs bowled along with that reckless defiant indifference that one knows only in dreams. It had been a day like other days at the office. Nothing special had happened. Harold hadn't come back from lunch until close on four. Where had he been? What had he been up to? He wasn't going to let his father know. Old Mr. Neve happened to be in the vestibule, saying goodbye to a caller, when Harold sauntered in, perfectly turned out as usual, cool, suave, smiling that peculiar little half-smile that woman found so fascinating. Ah, Harold was too handsome, too handsome by far. That had been the trouble all along. No man had a right to such eyes, such lashes, and such lips. It was uncanny. As for his mother, his sisters, and the servants, it was not too much to say they made a young god of him. They worshipped Harold, they forgave him everything, and he needed some forgiving ever since the time when he was thirteen and he had stolen his mother's purse, taken the money, and hidden the purse in the cook's bedroom. Old Mr. Neve struck sharply with his stick upon the pavement edge. But it wasn't only his family who spoiled Harold, he reflected. It was everybody. He had only to look and to smile, and down they went before him. So perhaps it wasn't to be wondered at that he expected the office to carry on the tradition. Hmm, hmm. But it couldn't be done. No business, not even a successful, established, big-paying concern, could be played with. A man had either to put his whole heart and soul into it, or it went all to pieces before his eyes. And then Charlotte and the girls were always at him to make the whole thing over to Harold, to retire, and to spend his time enjoying himself. Enjoying himself! Old Mr. Neve stopped dead under a group of ancient cabbage palms outside the government buildings. Enjoying himself? The wind of evening shook the dark leaves to a thin, airy cackle. Sitting at home, twiddling his thumbs, conscious all the while that his life's work was slipping away, dissolving, disappearing through Harold's fine fingers, while Harold smiled. Why will you be so unreasonable, father? There's absolutely no need for you to go to the office. It only makes it very awkward for us when people persist in saying how tired you're looking. Here's this huge house and garden. Surely you could be happy in, in appreciating it for a change. Or you could take up some hobby. And Lola the baby had chimed in loftily. All men ought to have hobbies. It makes life impossible if they haven't. Well, well, he couldn't help a grim smile as painfully he began to climb the hill that led into Harcourt Avenue. Where would Lola and his sisters and Charlotte be if he had gone in for hobbies? He'd like to know. Hobbies couldn't pay for the townhouse and the seaside bungalow and their horses and their golf and the sixty-guinea gramophone in the music room for them to dance to. 
Not that he grudged them these things. No, they were smart, good-looking girls, and Charlotte was a remarkable woman. It was natural for them to be in the swim. As a matter of fact, no other house in the town was as popular as theirs. No other family entertained so much. And how many times old Mr. Neve, pushing the cigar box across the smoking-room table, had listened to praises of his wife, his girls, of himself even. You're an ideal family, sir, an ideal family. It's like something one reads about or sees on the stage. That's all right, my boy, old Mr. Neve would reply. Try one of those. I think you'll like them. And if you care to smoke in the garden, you'll find the girls on the lawn, I dare say. That was why the girls had never married, so people said. They could have married anybody, but they had too good a time at home. They were too happy together, the girls and Charlotte. Hmm, hmm. Well, well. Perhaps so. By this time, he had walked the length of fashionable Harcourt Avenue. He had reached the corner house, their house. The carriage gates were pushed back. There were fresh marks of wheels on the drive. And then he faced the big white-painted house with its wide-open windows, its dull curtains floating outwards, its blue jars of hyacinth on the broad sills. On either side of the carriage ports, their hydrangeas, famous in the town, were coming into flower. The pinkish-bluish masses of flower lay like light among the spreading leaves. And somehow it seemed to old Mr. Neve that the house and the flowers, and even the fresh marks on the drive, were saying, There is young life here, there are girls. The hall, as always, was dusky with wraps, parasols, gloves, piled on the oak chests. From the music room sounded the piano, quick, loud and impatient. Through the drawing-room door that was ajar, voices floated. And were there ices? came from Charlotte. Then the creak-creak of her rocker. Ices! cried Ethel. My dear mother, you never saw such ices. Only two kinds. And one a common little strawberry shop ice in a sopping wet frill. The food altogether was too appalling, came from Marion. Still, it's rather early for ices, said Charlotte easily. But why, if one has them at all, began Ethel. Oh, quite so, darling, crooned Charlotte. Suddenly the music room door opened and Lola dashed out. She started, she nearly screamed at the sight of old Mr. Neve. Gracious, father, what a fright you gave me. Have you just come home? Why isn't Charles here to help you off with your coat? Her cheeks were crimson from playing. Her eyes glittered. The hair fell over her forehead. And she breathed as though she had come running through the dark and was frightened. Old Mr. Neve stared at his youngest daughter. He felt he had never seen her before. So that was Lola, was it? But she seemed to have forgotten her father. It was not for him that she was waiting there. Now she put the tip of her crumpled handkerchief between her teeth and tugged at it angrily. The telephone rang. Ah! Lola gave a cry like a sob and dashed past him. The door of the telephone room slammed, and at the same moment Charlotte called. Is that you, father? You're tired again, said Charlotte reproachfully, and she stopped the rocker and offered her warm plum-like cheek. Bright-haired Ethel pecked his beard. Marion's lips brushed his ear. Did you walk back, father? asked Charlotte. Yes, I walked home, said old Mr. Neve, and he sank into one of the immense drawing-room chairs. But why didn't you take a cab, said Ethel. There are hundreds of cabs about at that time. My dear Ethel, cried Marion, if father prefers to tire himself out, I really don't see what business of ours it is to interfere. Children, children, coaxed Charlotte. But Marion wouldn't be stopped. No, mother, you spoil father, and it's not right. You ought to be stricter with him. He's very naughty. She laughed a hard, bright laugh and patted her hair in a mirror. Strange. When she was a little girl, she had such a soft, hesitating voice. She had even stuttered, and now, whatever she said, even if it was only jam, please, father, it rang out as though she were on the stage. Did Harold leave the office before you, dear? asked Charlotte, beginning to rock again. I'm not sure, said old Mr. Neve. I'm not sure. I didn't see him after four o'clock. He said, began Charlotte. But at that moment Ethel, who was twitching over the leaves of some paper or other, ran to her mother 
and sank down beside her chair. There you see, she cried. That's what I mean, Mummy. Yellow with touches of silver. Don't you agree? Give it to me, love, said Charlotte. She fumbled for her tortoiseshell spectacles and put them on, gave the page a little dab with her plump small fingers and pursed up her lips. Very sweet, she crooned vaguely. She looked at Ethel over her spectacles. But I shouldn't have the train. Not the train, wailed Ethel tragically. But the train's the whole point. Here, mother, let me decide. Marion snatched the paper playfully from Charlotte. I agree with mother, she cried triumphantly. The train outweights it. Old Mr. Neve, forgotten, sank into the broad lap of his chair, and dozing, heard them as though he dreamed. There was no doubt about it. He was tired out. He had lost his hold. Even Charlotte and the girls were too much for him tonight. They were too, too... But all his drowsing brain could think of was too rich for him. And somewhere, at the back of everything, he was watching a little withered ancient man climbing up endless flights of stairs. Who was he? I shan't dress tonight, he muttered. What do you say, father? Eh, what, what? Old Mr. Neve woke with a start and stared across at them. I shan't dress tonight, he repeated. But father, we've got Lucille coming and Henry Davenport and Mrs. Teddy Walker. It will look so very out of the picture. Don't you feel well, dear? You needn't make any effort. What is Charles for? But if you're really not up to it, Charlotte wavered. Very well, very well. Old Mr. Neve got up and went to join that little old climbing fellow just as far as his dressing room. There young Charles was waiting for him. Carefully, as though everything depended on it, he was tucking a towel round the hot water can. Young Charles had been a favourite of his ever since, as a little red-faced boy, he had come into the house to look after the fires. Old Mr. Neve lowered himself into the cane lounge by the window, stretched out his legs, and made his little evening joke. Dress him up, Charles! And Charles, breathing intensely and frowning, bent forward to take the pin out of his tie. Hmm, hmm. Well, well. It was pleasant by the open window, very pleasant, a fine mild evening. They were cutting the grass on the tennis court below. He heard the soft chair of the mower. Soon the girls would begin their tennis parties again. And at the thought, he seemed to hear Marion's voice ring out. Good for you, partner. Oh, play, partner. Oh, very nice indeed. Then Charlotte calling from the veranda. Where is Harold? And Ethel. He's certainly not here, mother. And Charlotte's vague. He said... Old Mr. Neve sighed, got up, and putting one hand under his beard, he took the comb from young Charles and carefully combed the white beard over. Charles gave him a folded handkerchief, his watch and seals, and spectacle case. That will do, my lad. The door shut. He sank back. He was alone. And now that little ancient fellow was climbing down endless flights that led to a glittering gay dining room. What legs he had. They were like a spider's, thin, withered. You're an ideal family, sir, an ideal family. But if that were true, why didn't Charlotte or the girls stop him? Why was he all alone, climbing up and down? Where was Harold? Ah, it was no good expecting anything from Harold. Down, down went the little old spider, and then to his horror, old Mr. Neve saw him slip past the dining room and make for the porch, the dark drive, the carriage gates, the office. Stop him! Stop him, somebody! Old Mr. Neve started up. It was dark in his dressing room. The window shone pale. How long had he been asleep? He listened, and through the big, airy, darkened house there floated faraway voices, faraway sounds. Perhaps, he thought vaguely, he had been asleep for a long time. He had been forgotten. What had all this to do with him? This house and Charlotte, the girls, and Harold? What did he know about them? They were strangers to him. Life had passed him by. Charlotte was not his wife. His wife! A dark porch, half hidden by a passion vine, that drooped sorrowful, mournful, as though it understood. Small, warm arms were round his neck. A face, little and pale, lifted to his, and a voice breathed. Goodbye, my treasure. My treasure. Goodbye, my treasure. Which of them had spoken? Why had they said goodbye? There had been some terrible mistake. She was his wife, that little pale girl, and all the rest of his life had been a dream. Then the door opened, and young Charles, standing in the light, put his hands by his side and shouted like a young soldier. Dinner is on the table, sir. I'm coming. 
I am coming, said old Mr. Neve. End of An Ideal Family Recording by Ross Clement